All right, guys. So Benjamin Netanyahu continues to make Joe Biden look completely impotent when it comes to pressuring Israel to follow in line with anything that he says that he wants them to do. So the latest that we have on this is once again, Benjamin Netanyahu, after a heated phone call with Joe Biden, coming out and defying him, as they point out here in NBC News, renewing his pledge to launch a Rafa offensive. So just a little bit on this, they say, Netanyahu on Tuesday reiterated plans to launch an offensive in the southern Gaza city of Rafah less than 24 hours after President Joe Biden warned against precisely such a move in a call with the Israeli leader. Now keep in mind, when they say warned against, what do they actually mean by that? Because we saw that recent interview just a week ago or so, where Joe Biden, he came out and was directly asked, is there any red line? Would the invasion of, of Rafa be a red line for your administration? And he basically said, like, well, maybe it's a red line, but I'm never going to cut off anything from Israel. I'm going to continue sending them weapons, right? They have a right to defend themselves. Clearly, that's not what they're doing, defending themselves. But, you know, he immediately follows up by saying, oh, well, maybe I have some sort of a red line, but it's really just a red line purely in rhetoric, not in policy, not that we're going to stop rejecting UN ceasefires and vetoing those and covering for Israel at the United Nations, not that we're going to stop sending them hundreds of millions of dollars of weapons under the table, okay? Not that we're going to even apply real public pressure on them, but just like we are going to finger wag at them behind the scenes and maybe come out and say that we disagree with their strategy, but we still completely support them. So like th this word warned against, there is no warning if there's nothing to actually back up the warning. It's really just a suggestion, okay? They continue, they say, Netanyahu's defiant message came during the opening of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee in the Knesset, Israel's parliament, with him telling lawmakers that the country had, quote, an argument with Americans about the need to enter the city, which is sheltering more than one million Palestinians who fled their homes elsewhere in Gaza as it was being bombed. So to give you guys just a quick perspective here on a map, of what the population density looked like before October 7th versus what it looks like now after Israel's genocidal war for, you know, five months or so now. So this was before October 7th. As you can tell, the the bulk of the population, the densest parts of Gaza, were up here in the north. Okay, you got North Gaza and Gaza City and Daira El Bala and Khan Yunis and Rafa. And you also notice that Rafa, if you were to divide these up into these sections, is actually the smallest, okay, was the smallest both in terms of size and also in terms of population. Now, if you look at where it's at currently, you have half the population of Gaza that is crammed into what was previously 275,000 or so people. It's now over a million. And this map is actually back from late December. So this is a couple months out of date. So the situation has gotten even more dire with all of these people living in essentially a giant refugee camp, okay? Crammed down on the border with Egypt. And so, I mean, that's what it actually looks like on a map. The northern portion of Gaza has been essentially flattened to the ground. It's uninhabitable at this point. And then the southern portion is, is basically the same, but has been made into this giant refugee camp. They say Israeli forces needed to ensure, quote, the destruction or elimination of the military and governmental capabilities of Hamas. It's an interesting statement there the release of all our hostages and to ensure that Gaza no longer poses a threat to Israel, according to Netanyahu, reiterating the goals that were triggered by October 7th. He says, this necessitates the elimination of the remaining battalions in Rafa. We are determined to do this. And so we'll continue with some more information here from Anthony Blinken just in a second. But I do want to mention, like, it's kind of interesting how he says we want to destroy or eliminate not just the military apparatus of Hamas, but also the government capabilities of Hamas. He's talking about civilian, the, the civilian wing of Hamas. He's not talking about the military facilities. He's talking about the, the public infrastructure of Gaza, right? There's a difference between Hamas as a government apparatus, which includes everything, right? This is why you constantly hear the media and, and Israeli officials and U.S. politicians will say the uh, Hamas run Gaza Ministry of Health. It's like, yeah, it is run by Hamas. That's the government of Gaza but it's not run by Hamas militants. And so, you know, when, when Netanyahu says we want to totally destroy their government capabilities, I mean, it lines up with exactly what they have been doing, which in large part has been targeting what, what you know, from what we know from that uh, 972 magazine report, 
months ago at this point, is, is attacking what Israel refers to as power targets, which just means civilian infrastructure that they are intentionally targeting in order to terrorize the Palestinian people in Gaza. And so, I mean, he's kind of just openly admitting that by saying something like this. Now, in terms of whether or not they can actually destroy the remaining Hamas battalions or anything, guys, there is no evidence that Israel is going to be able to successfully defeat Hamas or remove them totally from power, or destroy the entirety of their military apparatus. Even the U.S. State Department doesn't agree with that. We've covered the reports that have come out over the last couple of months that have admitted that if this continues to go on, this could go on for years if Israel continues on the current trajectory. They're never going to be able to like fully get rid of Hamas. That's not how this shit works, especially when Hamas is using, you know, guerrilla tactics as a part of their, their strategy in fighting the IDF inside of Gaza. You're, you're just never going to be able to completely eradicate them in the same way that the U.S. was never able to eradicate the Taliban, right? In the same way that we saw similar failures in, in Vietnam, for example, this is just not something that is going to be able to be accomplished. And so the question isn't like, when is Israel going to completely defeat Hamas and kill all the Hamas battalions and, and leaders and, and militants? And then what happens after that? The question is, when is Israel going to stop slaughtering vastly disproportionately civilians? That's the question is like, when are they going to end this? Or when is the United States going to wake up one day and use some leverage to force them to end this. That's the actual question. You know, that the timeline on, on whether or not they're going to completely defeat Hamas is, is irrelevant because it's, it's not going to happen, guys. So, I mean, there you have it. Benjamin Netanyahu, once again, completely ignoring everything that Biden suggests to him because he's not using any leverage to back up his, his so-called warnings, right? And so I wanted to give you guys an update here before I end this video on the catastrophic situation in Gaza with with regards to um, uh, starvation. Okay, so we've talked about this for a long time now. Obviously, the ICJ report, and we're going to comment on this recent Oxfam report that came out specifically in regards to the ICJ ruling here in a second, but, you know, the part of the ICJ ruling against Israel finding that genocide was plausible in Gaza is that they ordered them to change the way that they were approaching humanitarian aid. In other words, to um, immediately facilitate the mass inflow of aid to Gaza to prevent mass starvation. Now, since then, they haven't done that. Surprise, surprise. And so the situation, especially disproportionately in the northern portion of Gaza, is as bad as you could possibly imagine. I mean, here from Axios, they say some 300,000 people in northern Gaza are expected to face famine conditions as early as this month a UN-backed body warned in a report that was released this last Monday. They say half of Gaza's population, more than 1.1 million people, have completely exhausted their food supply per the new report. Keep in mind, we're getting reports like this as at the same time that the Israeli government, that their spokespeople, their military officials, Benjamin Netanyahu, they are all coming out and just denying that starvation is taking place at all. Okay, we're going to touch on an APAC report that came out from the American Prospect here in a minute, where APAC is also pushing the idea that, oh, the, the, the notion that there is starvation in Gaza is completely fabricated. It's not true. So they're trying to gaslight the world in complete contradiction to what all major organizations around the world, humanitarian groups, what even the U.S. government at this point is admitting. They're just trying to gaslight everybody into believing that this is not happening. 1.1 million people completely exhausted their food supply. They say that marks the highest number of people ever recorded as facing catastrophic hunger by the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, the IPC, a group of governments, UN agencies, and aid groups that monitor global hunger. So in other words, you would have to literally believe that governments around the world, the United Nations and all of their various agencies, humanitarian aid groups, all experts, I mean, you'd have to disbelieve literally everybody except for Israel to buy into their argument that, oh, we're not actually preventing aid from getting into Gaza. There is no hunger in Gaza. I literally saw, and maybe I should have pulled this up for the video, but I, I literally saw the actual Twitter account for the State of Israel, their official government account, that tweeted out a picture that they said was from some por portion of Gaza, and it was like this tiny little food stand that had some food supplies in it, and they posted it trying to give people the impression of like, look, there's tons of food. Look at this little food stand that we just posted. How could there be starvation when this food stand has a bunch of food in it, right? 
I mean, it's just, it's, it's insanity. It is utter insanity. We got a quote here from the uh, director of the World Food Program, Cindy McCain, who said the speed at which this man-made hunger and malnutrition, man-made hunger and malnutrition crisis has ripped through Gaza is terrifying. And she said there is a small window to prevent an outright famine. And based on the current trajectory, we're not going to meet that window. Well, I shouldn't say we. Israel, the United States, are not going to meet that window. And so, in all likelihood, in the immediate future, we're, we're probably going to end up with a situation where, you know, we look at that 30,000, 40,000 number of uh, civilians who have been killed so far, and that's already a historic amount in terms of modern warfare, okay? But we're talking about hunger and starvation and disease in the very near future outpacing the number who have been killed by bombs and bullets and the rest of it. That's what's what's on the immediate horizon, not months and months and months in some hypothetical future, like within weeks. They're talking about at the end of the month, there, there's going to be famine conditions. And again, I'll link this down below if you guys want to go read the entire report here from Oxfam. But they say Israel government continues to block aid, uh, aid response despite ICJ genocide court ruling. So they're just ignoring what the International Criminal Court ordered them to do. And so they give a little bit more details on this. One of the things that stuck out to me here is just the amount of aid that they have allowed into Gaza. Israel has allowed 15,413 trucks into Gaza during the past 157 days of war. Oxfam says that the population of Gaza needed five times more just to meet their minimum needs. In February, they only allowed in 2,800 trucks, which is a 44% reduction from the month before. So like a month after the ICJ issues this ruling that you have a responsibility, you know, under the potential punishment of, of being convicted on the crime of genocide to allow more aid into Gaza. They cut the aid after. They reduced the amount of aid that was getting into Gaza. And so, I mean, like, I'm not going to try to do the, the mental math here in my head, but just as a reminder, before October 7th, the Gaza Strip was requiring about 500 trucks per day on average, okay? So if you've allowed in 15,000 trucks over 157 days, I mean, it, you know, 150 days of war, and you just multiply that by 500 trucks that were needed before October 7th, that just alone would have gotten you to what, 75,000 or so? So 75,000 would have been if you had just stayed consistent from the pre-October 7th levels of aid getting into Gaza. And now you're talking about significantly reducing that amount as the humanitarian situation has drastically worsened. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, incalculable, the lack of aid that is getting into Gaza. This is nowhere close to enough. It's not even a tiny fraction of what's actually needed. And so we even have guys like Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken, admitting this at this point, in direct contradiction to what even he himself was saying just a couple of months ago. So this was pointed out here by Aaron Mate. So, uh, you know, last week, or actually, this is last week. I was saying a couple months ago. This is from last week, guys. What the fuck are we doing? Last week, Secret Secretary Anthony Blinken boasted that the Israelis have, have been not only allowing food in, but also working to make sure that it gets in and gets to the people who need it. He then took credit for doing everything possible to maximize aid to Gaza. So, I mean, obviously, none of this is true. None of this is true. They're not allowing enough aid in, okay? They're blocking the aid from getting in. And then on top of that, in, in certain instances like the Flower Massacre and then the more recent Flower Massacre 2.0, they've actually directly attacked and killed people who are trying to get to some of the limited aid that has trickled into Gaza. But then he turns around now, this is just a week later, guys. He says, quote, 100% of the population in Gaza is at severe levels of, of, of acute food insecurity. 100% of the population. This is, and he points out later in this clip, this is the first time in history that and the entire population of anywhere has ever been at this level of severe food insecurity and, and potential famine and starvation. So this is a result of Israel blockading the aid from getting into Gaza as an intentional strategy and a part of their war on the people of Gaza. And this is also a result of the U.S. Biden administration doing absolutely nothing to stop it. I mean, what do we get? We get a port that hypothetically could be built in a couple of months and will still be a tiny fraction of the aid that's actually needed. 
I mean, even just the timeline of when the Biden administration is saying they're going to build this hypothetical port, even that timeline doesn't match up with the reports that we're currently getting from these UN organizations and aid groups and the rest of it saying that famine is imminent, not months down the line once you get your stupid fucking port set up, but like now, immediately. And so to push for anything other than an immediate ceasefire and a massive influx of aid and resources into Gaza, you're just complicit at this point. And, and not even at this point, you've been complicit the whole time. I'm going to have more reporting on that later today in terms of how complicit the Biden administration has been in continuing to ship weapons to Israel throughout all of this. But we'll finish off here with this. APAC talking points revealed. I highly suggest you guys read this entire article here from the American Prospect. But they say documents show that the powerful lobbying group is spreading its influence on Capitol Hill by calling for unconditional military aid to Israel and hyping up threats from Iran. So one other thing that I, I almost forgot to point out here, as they're admitting that 100% of the population in Gaza is at severe levels of acute food insecurity, um, we're also, right now, the U.S. government, is working towards some sort of a, a funding bill right now that would not only give additional aid and weaponry and the rest of it to Israel, but also officially codifies, under U.S. law, the shutting off of funding to UNRWA, the main organization that is even possible or, or that is even uh, capable of facilitating aid to the people of Gaza. It is codifying that into law, even as Israel has refused to provide any verifiable evidence that their claim that 12 out of 13,000 UNRWA employees in some way had a connection to October 7th, which wouldn't even justify cutting off the aid, even if it was true. But they're about to codify that into law as we're facing a famine in Gaza, cutting off aid additionally, more than they already have. And in the meantime, we have lobbying groups like APAC, who are incredibly influential, guys, and they're coming out and, and denying this reality. They say, though the primary motiv motivation for the conference that recently was involving this PAC was lobbying, the event also informed members about the PAC's congressional spending plans. APAC has pledged to drop over $100 million on campaigns this election cycle to defeat any congressional candidates who are even mildly critical of Israel. $100 million, guys. This week, the PAC touted its prowess to members as, quote, dollar for dollar, the largest contributor to candidates in the 2022 midterm elections. The largest contributor to candidates in the midterm elections, which were the most expensive midterm elections in history. So, I mean, basically you have an organization here. Somehow this is legal, by the way, because of how corrupt and broken and dysfunctional U.S. campaign financing is. Somehow it's legal to have a lobbying group and a super PAC that's sole purpose is to buy off politicians so that they'll do the bidding of a foreign government, in this case Israel, but it happens with other governments as well. But they're just allowed to do this legally to buy off our politicians so that they'll fall in line with the agenda of a foreign government. What the fuck are we doing here, guys? And trying to kick out members of Congress to replace members of Congress who are critical of this foreign government. How is this legal? And meanwhile, this is some of the sh shit that they're saying, right? They say even more controversial is that APAC is telling members of Congress that, quote, Israel is not blocking the delivery of aid to Gaza. Just completely lying. And that reports that people are starving in Gaza are false. So, I mean, again, I listen, I don't even know what to say at this point, guys. Broken campaign finance system that somehow allows a, a lobbying group and a super PAC to funnel money to buy off our politicians while claiming that the intentional man-made starvation as a part of their genocidal war on the people of Gaza is non-existent, that it's not happening. And they're able to buy off our politicians in order to get them to fall in line with that narrative. Meanwhile, we have the Biden administration, or Biden himself, getting on phone calls, impotently, weakly, wagging his finger at Benjamin Netanyahu, oh, please don't go and invade Rafa, I really don't want you to do that, but I'm going to keep sending you weapons. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to your bullshit intelligence that UNRWA equals Hamas and we're going to cut off aid to worsen the starvation that's underway. You know, we're not going to challenge you at the UN. We're barely going to say anything even remotely critical of you in public. And so we're, we're gearing up for an invasion of what is essentially a giant refugee camp in the southern tip of Gaza, where half the population has been crammed into because basically the rest of Gaza has been rendered totally uninhabitable at this point. 
and and they're just going to go through with this and what is biden going to do i mean after it is he going to do something is that going to be the red line no of course not of course not they're just going to say oh well we disagreed with their strategy you didn't do anything about it you did the opposite of doing something about it you 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 gave them the weapons to do it you enabled it you're complicit in it and so i mean there you go guys again i'm going to have more updates later in the day but um the more that we get out, I mean, literally on a daily basis now, it just gets more and more bleak.